Henry Esmond, ESQ, an office who had served with the rank of colonel during the wars of Queen Anne's reign, found himself, at its close, compromised in certain attempts for the restoration of the Queen's family to the throne of these realms. Happily for itself, the nation preferred another dynasty, but some of the few opponents of the House of Hanover took refuge out of the three kingdoms, and amongst others, Colonel Esmond was counseled by his friends to go abroad. As Mr. Esmond sincerely regretted the part which he had taken, and as the august prince who came to rule over England was the most paceable of sovereigns, in a very little time the colonel's friends found means to make his peace. Mr. Esmond, it has been said, belonged to the noble English family which takes its title from Castlewood, in the county of Hants, and it was pretty generally known that King James II and his son had offered the title of Marquis to Colonel Esmond and his father, and that the former might have assumed the Irish, peerage hereditary in his family, but for an informality which he did not choose to set right. Tired of the political struggles in which he had been engaged, and annoyed by family circumstances in Europe, he preferred to establish himself in Virginia, where he took possession of a large estate conferred by King Charles I upon his ancestor. Here Mr. Esmond's daughter and grandsons were born, and his wife died. This lady, when she married him, was the widow of the colonel's kinsman, the unlucky Viscount Castlewood, killed in a duel by Lord Mohun at the close of King William's reign. Mr. Esmond called his American house Castlewood, from the patrimonial home in the old country. The whole usages of Virginia, indeed, were fondly modeled after the English customs. It was a loyal colony. The Virginians boasted that King Charles II had been king in Virginia before he had been king in England. English king and English church were alike faithfully honored there. The resident gentry were allied to good English families. They held their heads above the Dutch traders of New York and the money-getting roundheads of Pennsylvania and New England. Never were people less republican than those of the great province which was soon to be foremost in the memorable revolt against the British crown. The gentry of Virginia dwelt on their great lands after a fashion almost patriarchal. For its rough cultivation, each estate had a multitude of hands of purchased and assigned servants who were subject to the command of the master. The land yielded their food, livestock, and game. The great rivers swarmed with fish for the taking. From their banks the passage home was clear. Their ships took the tobacco off their private wharves on the banks of the Potomac or the James River, and carried it to London or Bristol bringing back English goods and articles of home manufacture in return for the only produce which the Virginian gentry chose to cultivate. Their hospitality was boundless. No stranger was ever sent away from their gates. The gentry received one another and traveled to each other's houses in a state almost feudal. The question of slavery was not born at the time of which we write. To be the proprietor of black servants shocked the feelings of no Virginian gentleman, nor, in truth, was the despotism exercised over the Negro race generally a savage one. The food was plenty, the poor black people lazy and not unhappy. You might have preached Negro emancipation to Madame Esmond of Castlewood as you might have told her to let the horses run loose out of her stables, she had no doubt but that the whip and the corn bag were good for both. Her father may have thought otherwise, being of a skeptical turn on very many points, but his doubts did not break forth in active denial, and he was rather disaffected than rebellious. At one period, this gentleman had taken a part in active life at home, and possibly might have been eager to share its rewards, but in latter days he did not seem to care for them. A something had occurred in his life, which had cast a tinge of melancholy over all his existence. He was not unhappy to those about him most kind, most affectionate, obsequious even to the women of his family, whom be scarce ever contradicted, but there had been some bankruptcy of his heart, which his spirit never recovered. He submitted to life, rather than enjoyed it, and never was in better spirits than in his last hours when he was going to lay it down. Having lost his wife, his daughter took the management of the colonel and his affairs, and he gave them up to her charge with an entire acquiescence. So that he had his books and his quiet, he cared for no more. When company came to Castlewood, he entertained them handsomely, and was of a very pleasant, sarcastical turn. 
he was not in the least sorry when they went away. My love, I shall not be sorry to go myself, he said to his daughter, and you, though the most affectionate of daughters, will console yourself after a while. Why should I, who am so old, be romantic? You may, who are still a young creature. This he said, not meaning all he said, for the lady whom he addressed was a matter-of-fact little person, with very little romance in her nature. After fifteen years' residence upon his great Virginian estate, affairs prospered so well with the worthy proprietor that he acquiesced in his daughter's plans for the building of a mansion much grander and more durable than the plain wooden edifice in which he had been content to live, so that his heirs might have a habitation worthy of their noble name. Several of Madame Warrington's neighbors had built handsome houses for themselves, perhaps it was her ambition to take rank in the country, which inspired this desire for improved quarters. Colonel Esmond, of Castlewood, neither cared for quarters nor for quarterings. But his daughter had a very high opinion of the merit and antiquity of her lineage, and her sire, growing exquisitely calm and good-natured in his serene, declining years, humored his child's peculiarities in an easy, bantering way, nay, helped her with his antiquarian learning, which was not inconsiderable, and with his skill in the art of painting, of which he was a proficient. A knowledge of heraldry, a hundred years ago, formed part of the education of most noble ladies and gentlemen, during her visit to Europe, Miss Esmond had eagerly studied the family history and pedigrees, and returned thence to Virginia with a store of documents relative to her family on which she relied with implicit gravity and credence, and with the most edifying volumes then published in France and England, respecting the noble science. These works proved, to her perfect satisfaction, not only that the Esmonds were descended from noble Norman warriors who came into England along with their victorious chief, but from native English of royal dignity, and two magnificent heraldic trees, cunningly painted by the hand of the colonel, represented the family springing from the Emperor Charlemagne on the one hand, who was drawn in plate armor, with his imperial mantle and diadem, and on the other from Queen Boadicea, whom the colonel insisted upon painting in the light costume of an ancient British queen, with a prodigious gilded crown, a trifling mantle of furs, and a lovely symmetrical person, tastefully tattooed with figures of a brilliant blue tint. From these two illustrious stocks the family tree rose until it united in the 13th century somewhere in the person of the fortunate Esmond who claimed to spring from both. Of the Warrington family, into which she married, good Madame Rachel fought but little. She wrote herself Esmond Warrington, but was universally called Madame Esmond of Castlewood, when after her father's decease she came to rule over that domain. It is even to be feared that quarrels for precedence in the colonial society occasionally disturbed her temper, for though her father had had a marquis's patent from King James, which he had burned and disowned, she would frequently act as if that document existed and was in full force. She considered the English Esmonds of an inferior dignity to her own branch, and as for the colonial aristocracy, she made no scruple of asserting her superiority over the whole body of them. Hence quarrels and angry words, and even a scuffle or two, as we gather from her notes, at the governor's assemblies at Jamestown. Wherefore recall the memory of these squabbles? Are not the persons who engaged in them beyond the reach of quarrels now, and has not the republic put an end to these social inequalities? Ere the establishment of independence, there was no more aristocratic country in the world than Virginia, so the Virginians, whose history we have to narrate, were bred to have the fullest respect for the institutions of home, and the rightful king had not two more faithful little subjects than the young twins of Castlewood. When the boy's grandfather died, their mother, in great state, proclaimed her eldest son George her successor and heir of the estate, and Harry, George's younger brother by half an hour, was always enjoined to respect his senior. All the household was equally instructed to pay him honor, the Negroes, of whom there was a large and happy family, and the assigned servants from Europe, whose lot was made as bearable as it might be under the government of the Lady of Castlewood. In the whole family there scarcely was a rebel save Mrs. Esmond's faithful friend and companion, Madame Mountain, and Harry's foster mother, a faithful Negro woman, who never could be made to understand why her child should not be first, who was handsomer, and stronger, and cleverer than his brother as she vowed, though, in truth, there was scarcely any difference in the beauty, strength, or stature of the twins. In disposition, they were in many points exceedingly unlike, 
but in feature they resembled each other so closely that but for the color of their hair it had been difficult to distinguish them. In their beds, and when their heads were covered with those vast ribbon nightcaps which our great and little ancestors wore, it was scarcely possible for any but a nurse or mother to tell the one from the other child. Howbeit alike in form, we have said that they differed in temper. The elder was peaceful, studious, and silent, the younger was warlike and noisy. He was quick at learning when he began, but very slow at beginning. No threats of the feral would provoke Harry to learn in an idle fit, or would prevent George from helping his brother in his lesson. Harry was of a strong military turn, drilled the little negroes on the estate and caned them like a corporal, having many good boxing matches with them, and never bearing malice if he was worsted, whereas George was sparing of blows and gentle with all about him. As the custom in all families was, each of the boys had a special little servant assigned him, and it was a known fact that George, finding his little wretch of a blackamoor asleep on his master's bed, sat down beside it and brushed the flies off the child with a feather fan, to the horror of old Gumbo, the child's father, who found his young master so engaged, and to the indignation of Madame Esmond, who ordered the young negro off to the proper officer for a whipping. In vain George implored and entreated, burst into passionate tears, and besought a remission of the sentence. His mother was inflexible regarding the young rebel's punishment, and the little negro went off beseeching his young master not to cry. A fierce quarrel between mother and son ensued out of this event. Her son would not be pacified. He said the punishment was a shame, a shame, that he was the master of the boy, and no one, no, not his mother, had a right to touch him, that she might order him to be corrected, and that he would suffer the punishment, as he and Harry often had, but no one should lay a hand on his boy. Trembling with passionate rebellion against what he conceived the injustice of procedure, he vowed actually shrieking out an oath, which shocked his fond mother and governor, who never before heard such language from the usually gentle child, that on the day he came of age he would set young Gumbo free, went to visit the child in the slave's quarters, and gave him one of his own toys. The young black martyr was an impudent, lazy, saucy little personage, who would be none the worse for a whipping, as the colonel no doubt thought, for he acquiesced in the child's punishment when Madame Esmond insisted upon it, and only laughed in his good-natured way when his indignant grandson called out. You let Mama rule you in everything, Grandpapa. Why, so I do, says Grandpapa. Rachel, my love, the way in which I am petticoat-ridden is so evident that even this baby has found it out. Then why don't you stand up like a man, says little Harry, who always was ready to abet his brother. Grandpapa looked queerly. Because I like sitting down best, my dear, he said. I am an old gentleman, and standing fatigues me. On account of a certain apish drollery and humor which exhibited itself in the lad, and a liking for some of the old man's pursuits, the first of the twins was the grandfather's favorite and companion, and would laugh and talk out all his infantine heart to the old gentleman, to whom the younger had seldom a word to say. George was a demure studious boy, and his senses seemed to brighten up in the library, where his brother was so gloomy. He knew the books before he could well nigh carry them, and read in them long before he could understand them. Harry, on the other hand, was all alive in the stables or in the wood, eager for all parties of hunting and fishing, and promised to be a good sportsman from a very early age. Their grandfather's ship was sailing for Europe once when the boys were children, and they were asked, what present Captain Frank should bring them back? George was divided between books and a fiddle, Harry instantly declared for a little gun, and Madame Warrington, as she then was called, was hurt that her elder boy should have low tastes, and applauded the younger's choice as more worthy of his name and lineage. Books, Papa, I can fancy to be a good choice, she replied to her father, who tried to convince her that George had a right to his opinion, though I am sure you must have pretty nigh all the books in the world already. But I never can desire, I may be wrong, but I never can desire, that my son, and the grandson of the Marquis of Esmond, should be a fiddler. Should be a fiddlestick, my dear, the old colonel answered. Remember that heaven's ways are not ours, and that each creature born has a little kingdom of thought of his own, which it is a sin in us to invade. 
Suppose George loves music? You can no more stop him than you can order a rose not to smell sweet, or a bird not to sing. A bird. A bird sings from nature. George did not come into the world with a fiddle in his hand, says Mrs. Warrington, with a toss of her head. I am sure I hated the harpsichord when it shit at Kensington School, and only learned it to please my mama. Say what you will, dear sir, I cannot believe that this fiddling is work for persons of fashion. And King David who played the harp, my dear? I wish my papa would read him more, and not speak about him in that way, said Mrs. Warrington. Nay, my dear, it was but by way of illustration, the father replied gently. It was Colonel Esmond's nature, as he is owned in his own biography, always to be led by a woman, and, his wife dead, he coaxed and dandled and spoiled his daughter, laughing at her caprices, but humoring them, making a joke of her prejudices, but letting them have their way, indulging, and perhaps increasing, her natural imperiousness of character, though it was his maxim that we can't change dispositions by meddling, and only make hypocrites of our children by commanding them over much. At length the time came when Mr. Esmond was to have done with the affairs of this life, and he laid them down as if glad to be rid of their burthen. We must not ring in an opening history with tolling bells, or preface it with a funeral sermon. All who read and heard that discourse, wondered where Parson Broadbent of Jamestown found the eloquence and the Latin which adorned it. Perhaps Mr. Dempster knew, the boy Scotch tutor, who corrected the proofs of the oration, which was printed, by desire of His Excellency and many persons of honor, at Mr. Franklin's press in Philadelphia. No such sumptuous funeral had ever been seen in the country as that which Madame Esmond Warrington ordained for her father, who would have been the first to smile at that pompous grief. The little lads of Castlewood, almost smothered in black trains and hatbands, headed the procession, and were followed by my Lord Fairfax from Greenway Court, by His Excellency the Governor of Virginia, with his coach, by the Randolphs, the Careys, the Harrisons, the Washingtons, and many others, for the whole county esteemed the departed gentleman, whose goodness, whose high talents, whose benevolence and unobtrusive urbanity had earned for him the just respect of his neighbors. When informed of the event, the family of Colonel Esmond's stepson, the Lord Castlewood of Hampshire in England, asked to be at the charges of the marble slab which recorded the names and virtues of his lordship's mother and her husband, and after due time of preparation, the monument was set up, exhibiting the arms and coronet of the Esmonds, supported by a little chubby group of weeping cherubs, and reciting an epitaph which for once did not tell any falsehoods.